pretty much ever since I started talking about Unity ECS on this channel, there's been one topic that people have requested more than anything for me to make a video on. Does anyone have any guesses on what that might be? That's right, in today's video, I'm gonna be giving an introduction into some of the options that are available for us when it comes to implementing an animations in Unity's Entity Component System. Now, some of you may be surprised to learn that just because Unity doesn't provide an ECS-based animation solution doesn't mean there aren't options available for us. In fact, there are a bunch of different options, and I wanna give a big shout out to community member Luke Clemens for compiling a pretty comprehensive list of many of the options that are available to us. And in this list, you can see that there are actually multiple categories categories of different types of animation solutions available to us with some extra context about some of the benefits and limitations of each of these types of solutions. So anyways, in today's video, again, I want this to be an introduction into using animations in Unity's Entity Component System. So I'm going to be giving a little tutorial about how to set up the hybrid game object sync based approach because this doesn't require any third party libraries or packages or anything like that. You can use everything all out of Unity by default. And if you are already are familiar with using animators with Unity's game objects, then this is going to be really easy for you to learn how to use and set up and everything like that. Also, I'm going to be showcasing two great assets off of the Unity Asset Store, which allow you to quickly and easily implement animations um, that are fully compatible with entities so we don't need to do any hybrid game object synchronization or anything like that. And on that note, I do just want to take a quick moment to mention that the two assets that I'm going to be featuring today, which are the GPU ECS Animation Baker and the Rukhanka ECS Animation System, are both on sale as part of the Unity Asset Store Summer Sale. Right now is week three of the sale where myself and a few other creators handpicked out a bunch of assets off the Unity Asset Store, which are part of the sale. Of course, I picked out a bunch of dots ones and I did actually feature them in my previous video where I created a real-time strategy game using Unity's Entity Component System. Now, week three of the sale does end on August 17th. However, in the two weeks after that, there's going to be a best of sale where some of the most popular assets from the sale are going to be on sale for an additional two weeks. However, it's not guaranteed that any of the assets that I selected are going to be a part of that you know, best of sale for those remaining two weeks. So if there is anything that you're super interested in, make sure you pick it up when you can. And I will have some affiliate links to the assets used in today's video down in the description below. And those help support the Turbo Makes Games YouTube channel if you do decide to purchase anything and they don't cost you anything extra. Now, a quick disclaimer before we get into this video, I do just want to mention that animations are definitely not my specialty. So I'm not going to be going too deep into the whole animation setup. However, I will kind of give you the main things that you need to have set up. And it isn't really that different from just a regular standard Unity animation setup setup. Also, I do just want to mention that, of course, because this is an ECS based tutorial, you should have some familiarity with Unity ECS. Um, if you don't, I would recommend just checking out my zombies tutorial where I kind of give an introduction into ECS 1.0. So just going over a little bit of the Unity setup, you see that in the package manager, I do have the entities and entities graphics packages here, which are going to allow us to use ECS in the Unity game engine. Now you see that I do have uh, just kind of one of the demo scenes here from the Sinti Sci-Fi Worlds pack, and we're gonna go ahead and animate one of the little characters here. So I just kind of have this player game object. See that the character just kind of has a T-pose on them, and I have a little animator controller here. And this is a pretty simple animation controller. You see that by default, it'll just go into the idle animation. And then we have transitions going back and forth between the idle and the running animation. And you see that I do just have this one parameter for is moving, which is a Boolean. And when I check and uncheck that, it's gonna go ahead and play the running animation. So just to give you a quick demo of this, you'll see that when we enter play mode, you'll see that the character kind of automatically goes into the idle animation where he's breathing a little bit and stuff like that. And if you go ahead and check the box for is moving, you'll see that it goes over into the running animation. And then we'll go ahead and deselect it. Then it just goes back to the idle animation. So we're just kind of switching back and forth between these two animations here. Now we need to make sure this animator controller is set up just like this because all three different options that I'm gonna be showing you today will use this animator controller in some way. So again, this player is just kind of all working in the game object side right now. So let's bring him over to the entity side and kind of see what happens. 
So you see that I do have this hybrid player here. It just kind of has a player move script on it. So let's go ahead and drag this player game object as a child of this hybrid player here. And you actually see that when we do that, we get a warning in the console that basically just says that this shader on this particular object, it does not support skinning, which can result in incorrect rendering. Uh, see the documentation and all that. What's gonna happen if we enter play mode, you'll see that the character is still in the T pose. It doesn't go into the idle animation. And then when I start moving the character around with the move script that I've attached to it, uh, you'll see that it basically just kind of stays in the T pose. Now, of course, we want it to, um, you know, kind of go in the idle animation. And then when we start moving around, we can transition over to the run animation. So now that we can basically see that our character is working just fine on the game object side, but it's not working on the entity side. So basically what we're going to be doing with this kind of hybrid approach is basically take our player move entity, which is what's actually going to be kind of moving the player around in the entity world. And then we're going to go ahead and synchronize that with the game object side and the game object is basically going to receive information from the entity side to know which you know position and rotation to be in and also which animation it should be playing now to do that we can't necessarily directly reference this player game object from this hybrid player entity because this hybrid player entity is within a sub scene and the player game object is kind of within the main scene now we can't do actually any cross scene references between the main scene and the sub scene. So we kind of need a different approach to this. So you already see that this player game object is blue. That's because I've created a prefab out of it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and disable the player game object here. And we're actually going to be spawning new prefabs for this player. Okay, so now to jump over the code, I'm gonna be showcasing a couple of the data components that we're gonna be using. Now these data components are a little bit unique. They're different than regular components. You see that this first one here is a player game object prefab. And you'll notice that it is a public class of I component data rather than a typical public struct of I component data. Now the public class of I component data means that this is a managed data component, which means that any of the fields that we have in here, they can pretty much be any managed type. So when we use the public struct of I component data, we're again only limited to unmanaged types, you know, simple things like integers, booleans, floating numbers, and things like that. However, with the public class of I component data, we can now have things like references to game objects. So in this case, this is where we're actually going to be storing a reference to the game object prefab. So we can actually go ahead and instantiate that in the world. The other one that I have is another public class. This one's called the player animator reference. And this one is another unique type. This is using an I cleanup component data. It's very similar to how an I component data works, but it has a little bit of an extra feature, which is going to solve a specific problem for us later on. So I'll be kind of explaining again why we're using this I cleanup component data at this point. By the way, in past versions of Unity ECS, these cleanup components were known as system state components. And I did a video way back when those were called system state components. So if you do want a little bit more information on those, feel free to check out that video. But anyways, this component basically has a reference to the animator. And this animator is basically going to be the animator of the game object instance that we're going to be instantiating at runtime. Now we can access this animator from ECS code, which is going to allow us to say, set the specific animations that we want to play at any given time. And also it's going to give us access to the transform of this game object. So we can synchronize the position and rotation of the game object with the entity. And then here is the authoring component where we're actually setting things up for the output at entity. You see that we do just have one public field here, of course, for the player game object prefab. And in the baker here, we're going to be doing an add component object. We do need to use add component object when we're adding in these managed data components. And you see that we're just adding it to this entity and we're doing a new player game object prefab. We're gonna go ahead and set the value equal to the player game object prefab that we get from the authoring right here. And all we need is this player game object prefab components on this outputted entity. And we actually do not want to add the player animator reference at this time. We will be adding that later, however. So now we can just come back to Unity. We'll go to our hybrid player, which is in our sub scene. We'll go ahead and add the player animator authoring. And then from here, we can just go ahead and drag in a reference to our player game object right here. Now, if we were to hit the play button right now, nothing would happen because we're not actually instantiating this game object into the world. So we wouldn't be able to see anything like that. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually spawn this game object into the world. So we're gonna go ahead and create a new system here. This is the player animate system. You see that this is an I system. 
However, you notice that I do not have the burst compile attribute above the on update function. That's because inside here, we're actually going to be using managed types, which are not compatible with the burst compiler. It's also not compatible with the job system. So we need to make sure that we're doing everything on the main thread and not using the burst compiler. And the other thing that I will point out is that we actually are updating this inside the presentation system group. I've chosen to update it in the presentation system group just because this has to do with rendering. So it just kind of makes sense to put it inside the presentation group. And we know that the system is running after everything in the simulation system group. So anyways, just in inside our on update here, we're going to go ahead and just create a new local entity command buffer here like this. And then we're going to do our first uh, for each query. So this is basically going to look for everything that has a player game object prefab, but it does not yet have a player animator reference. So again, this is kind of the uh, just regular game object prefab reference. And this is the actual animator reference, which is actually going to be referencing the instance of the animator that is associated with the particular game object. And then you see that we also do a dot with entity access, and that's so we can actually have access to the entity. Um, so we can actually add components with the entity command buffer. So you see that I'm just naming these variables, the player game object prefab, and then entity, just nice and simple like that. So first thing that we're gonna go ahead and do is just spawn a new game object. So we create this new companion game object. We'll just do an object dot instantiate, and then we can do our player game object dot value to again, get a reference to the underlying game object value. Next, we're gonna go ahead and create a new player animator reference component, just called new animator reference is fine. And then the value of that, again, it's a animator type. So we can just go to our new companion game object and do a dot get component, pass in the type of animator right here. And then we're just gonna go ahead and use the entity command buffer to go ahead and add components to the entity this new animator reference that we've created. And then we just need to make sure down at the bottom here that we just do an ecb.playback and an ecb.dispose. So now if we go ahead and enter play mode, you'll see that we now have a game object representation of this player. Again, it looks very similar to the game object that we had earlier. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the inspector here and you'll notice that if I try and press the WASD keys to move around, you notice that the local transforms, the position and rotation are going to be go ahead and actually updating. So the, the entity player is actually moving around within the world. However, the game object player is not yet mirroring the position and it's not ch yet changing its animation. So at this point, all we're doing is just spawning a game object into the world. And then you'll notice if we do look at our hierarchy, you'll just see that we have this hybrid player here. And then we also have the player game object, which is a clone. So it's an instance of that game object. And it's kind of hard to tell, but that's actually outside of the sub scene there. So that's just kind of in the main game object scene. So in order to synchronize that, we'll just come back to our player animate system and I'll create a new for each just below that uh, previous for each here. And you'll see that this time we're going to be doing a query for everything with a local transform, a player animator reference, as well as a move input. So basically what I'm doing here is I just have a move input on the player and whenever we're pressing any of the keys it's going to go ahead and set the value of that move input so we can check if the magnitude of that move input is greater than zero if it is then we basically know that the player is moving and so we can set the appropriate property value on the animator there so you see that we're just going to go ahead and do our animator reference dot value and do a dot set bool that's just exactly the same way that we would do it in regular unity game objects and then we're of course going to be setting the is moving property and then the value of this is basically going to be dependent on the move input vector so the way that i have this set up is for each of these player entities when we're pressing around on the WAS and D keys, it's going to go ahead and update this move input. If the player is pressing any of these keys, the move input value, the magnitude of that, which we're getting from math.length is going to be greater than zero. If we're not pressing anything, of course, the magnitude of that vector is going to be zero. So basically the is moving is true when the player is pressing any keys and it's false when the player is not pressing any keys. So that's basically all that we're doing to kind of toggle back and forth between the animation. And then you'll see that just from the player animator reference, we can just do a dot value.transform.position. So these are in reference to the transform position as well as the transform.rotation of the game object that is associated with this animator here. And then we're going to go ahead and set these to the transform.position and transform.rotation of the entity. Note that this transform right here 
uh, is what we're actually getting from the query. And this is from the actual local transform right there. So hopefully that's not too confusing. This is just synchronizing the entities transform dot position with the game objects transform dot position and rotation. So now you'll see that when we actually press the WSD keys to move around, you see that the player transitions to the Naruto run animation. And you see that the position and rotation are being synchronized with the actual entity down here. And when we stop moving, it's gonna go ahead and transition just back to the regular idle animation state. So we can just kind of run around, transition back, run around, transition back, just like that. Now there is one final issue that I do just wanna demonstrate. So if we say run around and have the backspace key basically synchronized to delete the entity. So now we're kind of stuck in this running animation to see that I'm not actually pressing anything right now. And that's because what happened is we've destroyed the entity, but we haven't destroyed the game object. So that's where kind of this whole notion of the cleanup component comes into play. So we do just need to go back to our player animate system and we're gonna go ahead and add just one more of these for each statements here. So we're gonna be querying for everything with the player animator reference but things that do not have a player game object or a local transform. Now you may be a little bit confused about how we actually get into a situation where we have a player animator reference, but we don't have a game object prefab and a local transform. So again, that's kind of the magic of these cleanup components. So again, if we go back to this, the player animator reference is an I cleanup component data. Now we're using again, a managed class here, but of course these can be used with structs as well. Basically the way that these work is when we destroy an entity, any cleanup components are going to basically remain on the entity, but all other components are basically going to be destroyed. The reason for this is we can kind of look for things that have this cleanup component, but don't have other components, which basically means that the entity has been destroyed and it kind of prompts us to do some additional cleanup operations on this. So basically, you know, after we destroy the entity, the player game object prefab, the local transform, all of the components are going to be wiped off of this entity. However, the player animator reference is still going to be on that entity until we manually remove the component, which we're gonna be doing later. So now that we're kind of like within this state, what we can do is we can just go ahead and destroy the game object. So we'll just do an object.destroy, passing in our animator reference.value.game object. So we're actually just gonna go ahead and destroy the associated game object. And then finally, we just need to remember to actually remove the player animator reference from the entity. In doing so, it's going to remove that cleanup component and then the entity will actually be fully destroyed at that point because there's no cleanup components or any other components and so the entity just goes bye-bye. So now here, when we enter play mode, you see that we can still kind of run around. We can transition back and forth between the different animations. And this time when we're running and we press the backspace key, you'll see that the game object disappears when the entity disappears. So anyways, that's kind of an overview about the whole hybrid game object based approach where we basically have a game object that synchronizes its position, rotation, animations with whatever the entity is telling it to. Now this setup is pretty easy to use, especially if you're already familiar with Unity's built-in animator components and setup, because it is pretty much the exact same as just kind of interfacing with that as usual. However, you will see that there are a couple of additional things that we need to do and kind of consider, especially with the cleanup components and things like that, but really that that's kind of all you need to do. Now, another major disadvantage of this kind of setup is performance wise, because again, we are really just using a bunch of game objects. And of course, these game objects are all updating on the main thread without the burst compiler. So it's really just not the most efficient that we could be doing, especially when we have very, very high entity counts like we often do in Unity ECS games. So if that is the case where we start running into performance issues with this kind of easy to use hybrid setup, we might wanna start investigating some other options. Now I'm gonna be again showcasing a couple options that are available from the Unity Asset Store. I'm gonna be just going over a quick setup of these because I know this video is already getting a little bit long. And also these assets are definitely subject to be updated by the developer, so things may change over time. So I would highly recommend if you are considering any of these assets, go ahead and check out some of the documentations and tutorial videos put out by these different asset publishers. Um, because they actually are very, very helpful and they will have the 
the most up-to-date information. So the first asset that I'm going to be showcasing is the GPU ECS Animation Baker. The whole idea with this one is that we basically kind of do a little bit of a setup, and then it's going to go ahead and bake that animation information actually into a texture. And then this texture can be sampled from the GPU to perform all the skinned mesh deformations and everything like that on the GPU. So it, one of the major benefits is that, you know, we can have very, very high entity counts because this stuff is all happening on the GPU side. However, there are some limitations that we're going to run into, which I'm going to be showing you in this video. Although I do know the developer does have some plans to address some of these. So the first thing that we actually do need to do is create a very simple shader using shader graph. Now the developer basically tells you exactly how to set all this stuff up in the documentation and tutorial videos and stuff like that. So it's not really that difficult. You see that all we're doing is just sampling a um, regular base map and 2D texture. And you see that there is this kind of custom GPU ECS animator component, which kind of does all the magic of the mesh deformations and everything like that there. And then of course, once you have that, then you just go ahead and create a material based off of that shader graph. Again, just pointing it to the proper uh, color and normal maps that you want. Then finally, we're gonna go ahead and create this baked player prefab. You see that we do just need to go ahead and go to our actual model here on our skinned mesh renderer. And just make sure you change out that material for that baked player material, which you created in the previous step. And then kind of on the base of your prefab, you're just gonna go ahead and add this GPU ECS animation baker component. And then from here, this is where we do all our configuration about the different animation clips and everything like that that we need. So we need to just kind of go, out, go ahead and fill out this information for the different clips that we're using. You see that I have the idle clip as well as the Naruto run clip here. And then the last thing that you need to do is just go ahead and click the generate GPU GPU ECS animator here. It really just takes just a moment and then it's gonna go ahead and spit out a prefab here. Um, you'll see that this is actually a reference to the outputted prefab. You'll see that it kind of creates a little folder up here. And so this is the baked player GPU ECS animator. And if we look at this outputted entity, you'll see that it has this GPU ECS animator baker here. Um, and you can kind of take a look at some of the animations and things like that in here. And then I just went ahead and added in our regular player move authoring script here. So we can kind of move our player around in the world. And then so this is the actual prefab that we're going to go ahead and add into our sub scene here, which is going to get converted over to an entity. And then once that prefab is in our sub scene, we can go ahead and enter play mode and you'll see that the uh, character has kind of started its idle animation here right now. Um, you will notice that there is a little bit of an issue kind of going on with its helmet right here. Um, that is kind of due to one of the limitations of this asset at this time. I know this is one of the things that the developer is working on fixing because it is, it is kind of an important thing. But basically the reason for this is this helmet here isn't part of the actual skinned mesh. It's kind of a separate game object. So right now there isn't necessarily a way that you can say attach this helmet to a particular bone and have it kind of follow that uh, transform position right now. Um, so the other thing right now, you see that if we are kind of walking around, we're just staying in this idle animation. And that's because we're not actually doing anything to actually change the animations at this time. So I've just created another eye system here, which is the baked player animation system. And this is basically just looking for everything that has this GPU ECS animator aspect and a move input here. Uh, basically, again, we're just going to be looking at the move input to see if it's greater than zero or less than zero. If it's greater than zero, we can use our animator aspect to just do a dot run animation. And in here, we kind of pass in some parameters about the animation. So the first thing that we need to pass in is the animation ID. Now we can basically just kind of use the integer ID if we know, you know, which animation clip is which. However, on that component, I actually went ahead and chose to generate some uh, enums that are associated with this animation IDs. And then we can basically just cast an integer against this enum to, um, you know, pass in the particular animation clip that we want. So again, if we kind of, you know, reorder things that will always have the particular uh, correct index. And then here are just kind of some other options about, you know, what speed should the animations be played at? Do we want to add any animation blending? Uh, how long should the transition from one animation to another take? Everything like that. So you see that again, basically what we're doing here is if the magnitude of the move input is greater than zero, let's go ahead and play the Naruto run. If it's less than or equal to zero, go ahead and play the idle clip. So we will come back to Unity. And now you see that when we run around, the player is kind of moving into the Naruto run animation. And then when we stop, then the player just kind of goes back to its regular idle animation like that. However, the helmet is still just kind of like, you know, floating around in place. So the 
unfortunate kind of only solution that we have to do with that right now is just go ahead and delete that game object and we can come back here and everything works just fine. So that's actually kind of what I ended up doing in my RTS video is I just went ahead and said, okay, we're not gonna go ahead and use the helmet for this case. Okay, and then finally, I'm gonna go ahead and show up the Rukhanka animation system. So again, this is a very similar setup initially to the previous one. where We just have to go into the shader graph and just create a basic little shader here. We're just, again, sampling a main and normal texture here. And then we're gonna go ahead and just add this compute deformation here and go ahead and set this up to the position normal and tangent there. Once we've done that, just go ahead and create an associated material passing in whichever maps that you want to have. And then we'll go ahead and set up our Rukhanka player. This is basically, we can just use our regular player game object. We don't need to do any um, extra crazy setup because it just has kind of our regular animator on here. We do just need to make sure that we go down to our actual skin mesh and make sure we add on the Rukanka player material on there. Um, and the only extra thing that we really need to add is this rig deformation authoring script. You'll see that we don't actually even need to set any values in here, like literally just having this on here will basically set everything up for us. And then we can go ahead and set a player move speed on here. Again, that's just so I can move the player around within my game world here. So again, we'll go ahead and enter play mode. You'll see that by default, it does go into the idle animation. And you will notice that the helmet does actually match the particular position that it needs to. So that's great that it kind of stays in position there. Um, and then of course, we're not switching in any of the animations right now. So um, we'll go ahead and do that right now. So here is this Rukanka animation system. Again, this is another I system here. And then again, we're going to do something very similar that we've done before. We're just looking at the move input. We're seeing if the move input, you know, is greater than zero. So we can set the particular animation parameter. What this does is we actually get a dynamic buffer of the animator controller parameter components. So this is going to give us a way that we can access any of these different animator parameters that we have defined inside of our animator component right here. So right now there's only one, which is this is moving, but if we had a bunch of these, these would basically all show up as elements of the dynamic buffer, starting at zero and incrementing its index count here. So because we only have one, it's really easy to do. We can just basically access the is moving parameter um, off the animator controller at position zero. And then here we can just go ahead and set the bool value, again, equal to that math.length, passing in the move input value if that's greater than zero. So again, this is here where we're just setting it to true if we're moving, false if we're not moving. And then we need to make sure that we're actually setting the value back into the dynamic buffer. So we can do an add the animator controller dot element at zero is equal to the is moving parameter. And so again, the nice thing about this setup is it uses everything off of the animator component that we've already set up in just the regular Unity. So now when we actually go ahead and move around, you'll see that the, um, you know, character kind of transitions between the run and idle animations when we're moving versus not moving. So anyways, here's just kind of a comparison between the three. You'll see that on the far left, we have the game object set up in the center. We have the GPU ECS animation baker. And on the right, we do have the Rukanka animation system. You see that there are some, you know, slight differences between a couple of them. Um, again, the kind of big one is that you'll notice right now is with the GPU ECS, the helmet is kind of just floating in place here. So now when we kind of run around, you'll see that there are kind of, you know, the differences between these couple animation setups here. So anyways, that was an introduction into some of the options that are available to us for animations when we're using an ECS based project. Again, I would highly recommend that you go through the full animation options list posted by Luke, which is over on the Unity forums. And I'll have that linked down in the description below because it has, again, a little bit more context to all the different options that are available to us. And it lists out a bunch of ones that are open source and available through GitHub and everything like that. So anyways, if you do have any questions on today's video or suggestions for future videos, you can always leave those down in the comment section below or join us over on Discord over at tmg.dev discord. Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day and I'll see you in the next one.